it. So welcome to our first 2021 UNCG Alumni Lunch and Learn. My name is Yubi Aranda Sandoval. I am an Assistant Director in the Office of Alumni Engagement. It is my pleasure to introduce you to our guest speaker, Rich. Welcome, Rich. It's a pleasure to have you. So today's work in social environment, it is critical that we recognize, understand, and embrace the unique differences we all possess. It's also critical that we recognize, understand, and embrace the commonalities that we all share as humans. There's one experience that regardless of our gender, our generation, our race, our race or ethnicity, we all have in common. It's this. Life challenges. Long before COVID, we have all had our fill of life challenges. It was February of 2002 when I got the call. Hmm. Don? Okay, today, I'll see you there. That impromptu meeting took two hours. And at the end, I was fired from a company I own part of. Note to self, next time own more. I walked out feeling as if I got punched in the face. Right? I was dazed, I was uncertain, and I was hurt. I remember taking some time to sit with that. Right? There was a time in my life where I might have run from those feelings or denied those feelings or medicated those feelings, but not this time. I let them sit and I felt them. And I let some time pass on. Then some opportunities showed up, some new opportunities. One, in an industry I, I felt like I'd like, and this opportunity made a lot of sense. Salary, bonus opportunity, benefit package, technology budget, it made a lot of sense. Another opportunity, none of that. No salary, no bonus, no insurance, no benefits, no tech budget. The difference was considering doing that work made my heart jump. I was sure I could love doing this for a long time. This is the work I'm designed to do. So in the end, I made the decision to go with the option that made no sense, but made my heart jump. And it was that decision that led me to this very place right now today with you. And what I learned about myself as a result of that experience is that I'm heart centered. I make my best decisions when I lead with my emotions. How about you? Now, part of your registration was a link to a participant guide. Click on that link now or go to the chat and in the chat will be a link to this as well. What you're gonna do is take a moment and recall your life challenge, not your life challenge, a life challenge. Choose one. Take a moment to recall, how did you move through that challenge? And ultimately at the end, what did you learn about yourself? And that's gonna be an I am statement. I am, as I said, heart center. I am resilient, I am brave, you choose. So. We're gonna put two minutes on the clock. This might be the only two minutes you've had all week to yourself. So use it wisely. During these two minutes, again, recall that life challenge. How did you get through and what is, what is your I am statement that you learned about yourself? Two minutes on the clock. We'll talk to you in a minute, begin.
and time. All right, here's what's gonna happen next. We're gonna collect your I am statements. Here's how it's gonna work. Pull out your phone or go to your internet on, on your computer and dial or click in www.menti.com. This is also in your chat box. This link or this website, www.menti.com is in the chat box. Go there and enter your unique number for all of us, 68, 67, 191. This is your unique code for all of us. Once you do that, you're going to enter your I am. Mine was heart center. Yep, you got it. Enter your I am statement. You are what? I see you're resilient. I see you're curious. I see you're, you have perseverance. You're, yes, we got another heart center. Or maybe that's me. Keep putting them in. Put them in. What you'll notice about this word cloud is that the size of the font represents how many people selected that quality. So resilient seems to be a top quality that many of you have noticed as a result of your life challenge. People focused, looks like it might be in second. Keep entering those. Take this in for a moment, enjoy it. Growing, yeah, essential. Very cool. Okay. This is, this is a good time to uh, point out that this technology right, and your experience today is being brought to you by my wife and business partner, Sarah Schlintz. Hey. <laughs> She's doing what her role is what we call drive the spaceship. If it wasn't for her, we'd be on a 1986 conference call. So thank you, Sarah. Yes. All right. So here, as you look at those words, those qualities, they're more than words, they're qualities. Let, let's consider, if we were a team, right? So if all 85 of us were on a team together and we possess these qualities right now, in this moment, these qualities are present within us, what might we be able to accomplish together? Good answer. <laughs> anything. Yeah. We could accomplish anything we put our minds and our hearts to. And what that demonstrates is the exponential power of culture. Culture eats strategy for breakfast. That's what Peter Drucker says. He doesn't say strategy is not important in business. What he says is that he reminds us that strategy is birthed by uh, applied by and sustained by people, people who believe deeply, people who are intelligent, people who are resilient, people who are people, people who are people centric, right? So we think about culture is your company's superpower and it's often overlooked. Now you have a role and so do I in an engaged and meaningful and thriving culture. And our role is to lead thyself. That's our job, is to contribute at our highest level as part of that culture, a culture being the sum of its people by leading thyself. Now, there's a challenge, and there often is, on the journey to lead thyself. And the challenge is called programming. Let's talk about that for a moment. When we say the word programming, let's use an analogy. How about a computer? So a computer has an operating system and that operating system allows the computer to interface or interact with uh, a wireless mouse, a keyboard, an app, the internet. And that operating system is driven by programming. So programming drives the operating system. Operating system influences the computer's ability to interface and interact with the world around it. For us, our operating system is our belief system. Every day, the habits and the actions we take are driven by our belief system. The fact that you're here right now is because you have a belief system. 
Perhaps you have a belief system that investing an hour in your development is wise. Now, your belief system and mine, just like that computer is driven by programming. Programming is the information, the experiences, the ideas that we intake throughout our life, our family of origin, coaches, teachers, educational system coaches are, are, are all part of providing us programming that forms our belief that drives our behavior or our interaction with the world around us. And there's some programming that can get in the way of us leading thyself. Let's explore some of that. And let's start with a question. If I was to ask, who's the most important person to your work? Who's the most important person to your work? 99.99% .99 of the people would respond, customers or clients or patients or residents or students, whatever that label is, that is your end user. That would be an immediate, almost 100% response. So the question is why? why? Why is that the pat answer to that question? Well, it makes sense, right? Without customers, clients, without students, we don't have business, we don't have work, there's no revenue, there's no need, there's no product or services required. Makes perfect sense. And there might be another reason why we answer that question so quickly. Programming. In other words, somewhere along our workplace journey, a person in authority, a person in charge who we thought was smart. They probably told us in some meeting or some one-on-one -on -one interaction, hey, in case you're wondering, the customer is the most important person in our business. You're like, wow. We write that down. You're like, I got it. I got it. And that programming formed into a belief system. And the belief system derives, drives our interactions at work, at interactions that say, and behave as if the customer is the most important person in our business. So let's think for a second. You remember when we used to fly? You remember 2019? We used to fly. <laughs> and before we could take off, a professional flight attendant would give us some instructions. Now we weren't paying attention, but there's one piece of that safety announcement that's we should pay attention to, and that is this, in the unlikely event that we should lose cabin pressure, a mask, an oxygen mask, will descend from the overhead compartment. We're to take that mask and immediately put it on the person next to us. Thank you for disagreeing. I love the body language. You're like, that speaker's wrong. That is, you're absolutely correct. That professional told us to put the mask on ourselves. So what's the wisdom there? We get it, right? At 30,000 feet, we're no good for anybody if we've passed out. It is, it is taking care of ourselves first that actually makes us more effective to help the passenger next to us, right? Or someone else around the plane. That wisdom shows up in the workplace. And it sounds like this. Jim Rohn, one of the forefathers, of professional de development said this, work harder on yourself than you do on your job. Work harder on yourself than you do on your job. Just like the airplane, initially that might sound selfish, that might sound anti-establishment, but the same wisdom is applied. That if you run around work blue in your face, if you're running around work gasping for air, you're no good for your customer, your client, your resident, your patient, your student, or your colleagues. That the most effective you, right? The you that is oxygenated is the, the beneficiary of that is the organization, the client. It's not about, this is not about lowering the value of your client. This is about elevating the value of you because your ability to contribute at your highest level is the cultural impact that we need. So let's revisit that question. Who's the most important person in your business? It's not the customer. It has been, it is, and it always will be you. So what do we do with that? All right, what do we do with that reality? Because along with this, this honor, the honor of being the most important person in your business, and rem remember, it's because, of, because you are at your best that everyone else you interact with is a beneficiary of that. 
it has a responsibility. And it means that you are in charge of leading yourself. And most importantly, you're in charge of your transformational journey. So let's talk about this transformational journey that's so integral to lead thyself. And let's start by thinking about the word transformation as opposed to a word that's a common word change. We use that in the workplace, change management, right? We've got to make some changes. Well, we just passed a milestone in our calendar. That's January 1st. And on January 1st, Americans are all making a, you know what it is, resolution. And we can identify what those resolutions are. We're going to eat better. We're going to exercise. We're going to stop cursing. We're going to be a better person. You know, on and on and on the list goes. Now, if you've ever been a member of a fitness center, more than a year, you've noticed something. Those, the equipment you love and the classes that you sign up for on January 2nd, they're taken, they're full, they're crowded. You also know a secret. If you wait to February 1st, the equipment and the classes that you love, they're free again. That's change. Change has a short shelf life. It's really a battle of wills uh, to see how long I can do something that I don't really want to do anyway. Not so with transformation. Transformation is a journey when there's no going back. What's this? Yeah, an acorn. Good answer. Could it also be this? In other words, packed inside that acorn is everything needed, all the DNA required, no thing is missing for it to express itself in full oakness. The answer is yes, it's all there. Now, the, the acorn's got to go to work, right? It's got to go to work. It's got to break open and it's got to interact with uh, an environment. It needs some soil. It needs some moisture and some light. And in that environment, when it goes to work, it becomes what it's intended to be. Much like the butterfly can't go back to the caterpillar. The oak cannot return, nor does it want to return to its acornness. Now, there's something unique about us as human beings along our transformational journey. We can opt out. Unlike the oak tree and the butterfly, we can opt out and remain stagnant. Hmm. Now, work is an ideal soil for transformation, the transformation that results from lead thyself. And here's why. Here's why work is an ideal soil for us to crack open right, and become our full oakness. One, time. On average, over our life, we'll spend 90,000 hours at work. That's a lot of time. And that is too much time to remain the same. The other characteristic is challenges. Work is full of challenges. Now, we have different labels uh, for challenges. It depends how um, stressful the challenge becomes and how irritating the challenge becomes it can have a new label and we'll call it problems. And some of those problems, and, and they can show up as people, as processes, as projects, right? These problems show up as all sorts of things. But when they don't go away, when they keep showing up day after day, week after week, month after month, we call them pattern problems. And that's ideal fertilizer for our soil of transformation. We'll talk more about that later. So we know why work is such a great place to lead thyself along a transformational journey. One, because of time and two, challenges, which are problems. How do we make the use of that? Or how do we make the highest use of that? Well, first, let's consider what thought leader Seth Godin says. He says, What's up, Seth? He always pops into our shows unannounced. So Seth Godin says, many people want more authority. You get more done when you take responsibility. Sometimes Seth gets pushy with his quotes here too. So what he's telling us is that 
it's we need to take 100 responsibility for what and who us now that's a challenge because we love distractions as human beings when you talk about commonalities here's a commonality we love distractions we love to think we're in charge of other things and other stuff and that's an illusion our opportunity in growth and development is to take responsibility for the only thing and only person we actually are in charge of it, and that's ourselves. It's this idea of, um, of really mastering ourselves, which is a lot more difficult than we would ever think. So first, take responsibility for our journey for ourselves. Second is identify some potential traps. Now, what are some potential traps that can prevent us, that can hold us back from leading thyself and having this transformational journey? There's two of them. One is blame. And we learn early in life. We master this, self-mastery. We have blame mastery early in life. I'm one of five kids, grew up in central New Jersey. I learned how to use this to save myself some pain at times. If I could blame any one of my siblings, or if I could blame a neighbor or a friend, my punishment might be reduced. The challenge is, now that I'm adult, this isn't helping me. It's holding me back. And the other trap is excuses, right? Whether I'm making an excuse for myself or an excuse for others, neither blame nor excuses have any space for learning. So after we've taken responsibility and identified these two traps, it's time to apply a tool or to implement a tool. We call this tool courageous questions. Oh, you know what? Before we do this tool, let's talk about mindset. Thank you, co-pilot. Let's talk about mindset. So you take responsibility. You've identified traps. Next is to reframe our mindset. Now, remember the pattern problems we talked about earlier. What we want, ideally what we want to do with pattern problems is get rid of them. We want them out of our life. That person, that project, that process that won't go away, that frustrates us, irritates us, stresses us out. Now, in case you're wondering, I'm not sure what that is. Phone home, phone home, because they know what your, what your pattern problem is. Because when we get home at night, that's the thing we talk about and complain about over dinner. So Wayne Dyer, he says this, when you change the way you look at things, the things you'll look at change. When you, when me, when we change the way we look at things, the things we look at change, which is very empowering because what it's telling us is I control this. And if I could see a pattern problem, not as an enemy, but if I could see a pattern problem as more of a tenacious teacher, it changes everything. In other words, this thing is not against me. This thing or this person is for me. Now, they don't know it. So that person that's been frustrating you for months, they don't know they're your tenacious teacher. That, that happens beyond your realm. You need to know it because it's going to impact how you respond to them. So this thing, it is in your life for you to learn and grow. And it won't leave until you do that, or it won't reconcile until you do that. All right, so how can we utilize the time and the challenges at work to be the a proper soil to lead thyself in a transformational journey? We gotta take responsibility, we gotta identify some key traps, and then we've gotta reframe our mindset when it comes to these challenges. Now we're ready. Coach, are we ready? We're ready. <laughs> now we're ready for the tools. And the tool is, a, is, is called Courageous Questions. Now, Courageous Questions sound like this. Once you identify your tenacious teacher, once you identify the person, process, or project that's causing you the most, frustra the most frustration or challenges or suffering at work, you ask yourself, what's my role in this? Now, this question is aimed at the person you're responsible for. This question is not allowing you to be uh, distracted by the illusion that it's them. They need to change. They need to leave. They need to fix it. Because if we try that, and how's that working for you? 
not so much. It hasn't worked for me. So this question is, what's my role in this? And a side note, if your first response is nothing, I, I have no role in this. That is actually your role. Nothing is a role. If it's a person that you've got a challenge with in your life, that you are clashing with, you've got conflict with, and you say nothing, then write down that as your, as your role because something needs to be done and something needs to be done by you. Second, what might I do differently? So after what my role in this, what might I do differently? And then finally, how is this helping me grow? Because ultimately, we think about Maslow's hierarchy of needs. Ultimately, this journey of transformation of lead thyself is about your self-actualization, right? It's not, we're not talking about survival now. We're talking about your self-actualization. And this is about you growing and developing. Early on in my coaching speaking career, I noticed something, inconsistency. I noticed that I'd leave some workshops with clients uh, feeling really good. We nailed it. They got their, their investment worth. And then other workshops, other learning experiences, I'd leave wondering, did anything happen here? I'm, I'm not sure. I'm not sure we connected. I'm not sure they got their value. And this became a pattern problem. One day, after exhausting my blaming, right? You can only blame the audience so many times. You can only make excuses for your room setup so many times. This day, I asked myself the question, what's your role in this, Rich? This seems to be a recurring theme for you that's not beneficial for you or the client. What's your role in this? And when we ask that question, this is not the voice that lives in your mind that is angry with you, uh, oppressive. This is a language that, or this is a, um, a voice that is loving. This voice has your best interest in mind. So the tone is appropriate, the tone is important. So this tone was rich, what's your role in this? How are you contributing to this outcome? And when I sat long enough to really think and gave myself permission to be honest, here's what I heard, raw talent, raw talent. Here's what I mean by that. I was flying by the seat of my pants. And I thought that was pretty cool. At one point, I thought that was pretty cool because I had enough talent to be good. We never have enough talent to be great. And my role was spying by the seat of my pants. So the next question was, what might I do differently? And the answer was, you need to prepare and practice like a pro. This is not your hobby. This is your profession. As a professional, I needed to prepare and practice like a pro does. And the final question, the one that's most challenging is, well, what's the growth here? Right? Because, because this is going to push us into our, into our, our emotion, right? What's, what's the growth opportunity here? And for me, it was courage. And here's what I mean by that. I was finally doing the work that was placed within my heart. Khalil Gibran says, when we're born, our work is placed within our heart. This was that work. And I was scared. What if what if I didn't nail it? What if I wasn't good enough? What then? So it was about having the courage to practice and prepare like a pro and believe that this was the work I was intended to do. So that's an example of using the tool. Now, here's the result. Going forward, I was not the same. There was no going back. From that time on, raw talent was not what I relied on. From that point on, I, the programming changed. I believed and behaved like a pro and made all the difference in the world. That's transformation and that's lead thyself. I didn't need a supervisor or a colleague to tell me to do that. I needed to find it within myself. Now, knowing this will do nothing. 
knowing this would, because this is a tool. And the only way we can transform a tool into a skill is by what we call swinging the hammer, right? Swinging the hammer is how we transfer a tool into a skill. So here's your next step. And this next step is going to happen within the next 12 hours or so. Between now and bedtime tonight, carve out 15 minutes for yourself. And one, identify a pattern problem, which is your tenacious teacher. Identify a person, place, uh, I'm sorry, a person, process, or project that has been frustrating you for some time. Name it. Then tell a story. What's going on? What, what is going on with this thing that's frustrating you? And then finally, apply the questions. What's my role in this? How have I contributed to this? And it might be nothing or it might be something. It is something. Which, what might you do differently? And how is this helping you grow? And if you want to up the courage and up the results, up the outcome, consider taking this work, consider taking this information to a trusted colleague and share it. Someone you trust and let them know, I've identified a tenacious teacher in my life and I've reflected on what my role is. And here's something I could do about it. And here how this, here's how this is gonna help me grow. And invite them, invite their perspective in. Within the workplace, there's a ton of peer resource that we don't take advantage of. We don't take a coffee break or a lunch break and tap in to a peer coaching opportunity where we can get some honest reflection and encouragement along this path of transformation. This is a difficult path. I remember my, my oldest daughter went down for a nap one time and uh, she started screaming and she grabbed her legs and started screaming. I was wondering what's going on here. Um, and then I realized growing pains, literal growing pains. My daughter, her bones and her legs were expressing the pain of growth. And, and that's whether it's physical growth, emotional, intellectual, spiritual growth, it's painful. Now it's worth it. It's worth it because the end result is valuable. But lead thyself along a transformational journey. Let's, let's not kid ourselves. It's a lot of work. That's why opting out is such a popular option, but not for you. That's not for you. Your commitment is to make application and do the work right, to benefit from self-transformation. So let's do this. We've got a, um, a few minutes available for some interaction, some, some Q&A. Yubi, do we got any, what do we have in the chat box that we could create a, a, a conversation with? Or, um, we did get a question and it says, what um, are Rich's suggestions for growing your career for individuals who are experienced in, in or more senior level roles versus just starting their career? Um, how do you prevent, well, let's answer that first. Well, actually go, go through the whole thing and then we'll, we'll piece it up, go ahead. Okay, sure. And then the second part to that was, how do you prevent or at least minimize career burnout? Okay. All right, let's start there and then we'll work our way back because career burnout is a big deal these days. It, it seems to be at epidemic proportions, similar to disengagement in the workplace. So let's, let's get clear about one thing regarding burnout. Burnout is not effort related. And that's the easy default. Well, I'm burnt out because I'm working so hard. And here's why that's not the case. And the evidence is, this evidence is self-evident. Here's what I mean by that. All of us at some time in our life were giving our absolute all. I mean, everything we had to some initiative, some goal, some journey that was important to us. And during that time, we felt fully alive in the zone. So that is the evidence to let us know it's burnout has nothing to do with work rate or effort. Burnout has everything to do with purpose. When I'm on purpose, giving myself 
fully to the thing is exactly what I'm designed to do. What we find in the workplace is there's a significant lack of purpose. What is my purpose? Why am I here? How am I making a difference? How am I contributing? How am I valued, appreciated? And when those answers are left void, I feel empty inside and I got to give it a name. And the name that we've put onto it, the label is burnout. I just must be burnt out. So again, so first is how can I reignite my purpose or my passion in my current workplace? Which who's responsible for that? Is it the CEO? Uh, is it your, your VP of operations? No, it's us, right? So who's responsible for you ensuring that your work is on purpose and meaningful? It is you. You need collaboration, no doubt about it. You need collaboration, you need partnership. It's not their responsibility though, it's yours. And that means if it can't happen at your current workplace and you have a responsibility to find another place, a new place to contribute. The second question was about being more senior level, you mean, right? Yes, senior well, level. before we jump into that, um, there was a, a question in the chat box that is related to this. And it says, how do you avoid getting caught up in the feeling of, I don't feel like it? Okay, the feeling of, I don't feel like it. So any feeling, uh, think about your dashboard, right? So you're driving your car and you see a light come on. It's a, it, it looks like an oil can, right? Or you see a light come on, it's the letter E in bright yellow, all right? Those are indicators. And uh, they're there for a reason so that you'll know, hey, I, this needs my attention. I should check on. So the feeling itself is not good or bad, no more than the indicator light on your dashboard is good or bad. It's what you do with it. So if the, tell me the feeling again. If the feeling is. I don't feel like it. All right. Again, so I'd, I'd reverse engineer that. The question is, what do you feel like? Or why aren't you feeling like that? Or what's preventing you from feeling like it? What's the thing, what's going on? Explore that feeling until we can get to some type of identify what's the root cause of this. Again, you know, am I, do I have a purpose in my work? Are my skills, are my talents being utilized? Do I feel valued? Do I have a say? These are all human conditions that connect to individual and team engagement. So it's got to be self-exploration to figure out what is the cause of that indicator light. And then once you get there, you got to do something about it, right? You got to take some type of action to reignite or reconnect with workplace. If, if you're counting down the days, if, if I would say to you, hey, tell me about your work, tell me about your job, and you start calculating and you say to me, 12 years. That's a problematic answer, right? What you're telling me is that you're, you're more interested in when you're, when you're released as if, as if you're incarcerated than doing meaningful work and being fulfilled and making a difference and making an impact. Um, and, and then again, that's an indicator that something needs to be shifted or changed because we cannot work for our, our release date. That, that's, that's no way to live out this experience. What are the questions? Uh, Lauren, uh, it looks like you may have a question. Um, if you want to go ahead and let me see, let me ask you mute. Let me see. Let me Hi, unmute. thank you for taking my question. So um, in my example of not feeling like it, I really want to seek a creative career. And I find myself that after working out and going to work in my regular job, I just feel like I'm tired or I don't have enough to give to put into my creative career. But I spend a lot of time watching TV and playing video games and relaxing, but I'm not putting enough time into my professional career that I really would like to see grow. How do I get over what I feel like is a hump or something that's preventing me from going for something that I really feel like is my dream? Yeah, cool. Lauren, first of all, man, thank you for your honesty. That's, that's cool. You're like, you know what? Here's what I am doing. It's not time. It's, it's never time uh, because we all have the same amount of time. I, I'd say it's the um, one thing to consider uh, is, uh, we're, I'm gonna give you a link to a TED talk in a minute. 
is the why. Okay, so if, if, you, if you have this creative piece in you, there's this creative nature in you that needs to be expressed itself in work, it needs the why. Um, um, oh, shoot, what's the, um, forget the author's name. Right? People don't buy what you do, they buy why you do it. Simon Sinek, Simon Sinek, right? The power of why. So what is your why? Why do you want to express your, your, your creative nature? Before the what, get to the why, dig down. Why am I here? Why am I, um, why am I here specifically like in the triad? Or why am I, why am I here on the, on the earth, right? Why am I at this job? find out, try to get to the point where there's a why that's going to compel you. Because when the why is there, you won't be distracted by the TV. You will be focused on your journey. And we'll talk later. You can also reconnect with us through our website. We'll talk about that later. We can expand on that a little bit. There's a TED Talk about procrastination. The best thing we do is Google TED Talk procrastination. And you can TED Talk Tim Urban. Tim Urban. It's fun and it's interesting. And, and it's, it points out the fact that we all are procrast procrastinators at some level. We got to have a self-imposed deadline or finish line, we call. And that's got to be predicated by why. There's something important for me to accomplish. And I'll be about that right, when I see it. Great TED Talks. I want that very good. We have time for perhaps one more, one more question. What will that be? And this was... Um... Let me see. This was part of the one that came in through the um, through the email. Um, for individuals who are more experienced in a more senior level roles uh, versus just starting their career, what are your suggestions for growing your career? Okay, I think I saw a chat that might have mentioned something about mid middle age. So, so. <laughs> Well, one, you got to define what growing your career looks like because that doesn't look the same for everybody. Some, at some times in our life, career growth looks vertical, clearly vertical. Other times in our life, not so much. So one, what does career growth look like for you? And as we progress along the workplace journey, what do we have to offer that we didn't have as we're coming in um, you know, uh, as, as, a, as a, a, a millennial? What we have is experience. What we have is wisdom. If we, can, if we can leverage that in the workplace, so one way to grow is realize that you have got something to offer, particularly as a mentor, as a mentor to, to young and up-and-coming talent. So consider opening yourself up as or offering yourself as a uh, you could be a technical mentor. It could be a certain skill that you've mastered that other people need to know, and you can translate that information. Then it could also be a, you know, a, a mentor of how to navigate the workplace culture, right? how to communicate more effectively, how to interact cross-functionally. So, one recognize what value you have. Who who else needs that? How can you offer it? And define what growth looks like for yourself, because that changes over the seasons of our life. When we're an acorn, growth looks different than we're, when we're a matured oak. But that matured oak can offer things the acorn can't, particularly shade right, and a place to rest uh, and some stability that's not present in that fast growing happening acorn. All right. Do we've got three minutes? Want to come in for a landing or you got one quick question for us? I think we are good. You answered uh, Jared's question uh, about um, navigating through self-doubt. So um, let's okay. see. Oh, here. And there's one right before that. Um, it said, I agree with the concept of accepting responsibility for changing interactions with tenacious teachers. How do we deal with uh, a coworker who is very difficult? Is it isn't necessarily personal. All staff feels the same. Okay. So how do you deal with that, that difficult uh, teammate? You know, realize there's a, there's a saying where um, everybody's fighting their own battle, right? So it could be that that person, um, life experience is creating a scenario where they're, 
They seem like they're not approachable. They seem like they're standoffish. And it could be that their life experiences have created that as a defense. Maybe you're the one that's going to take initiative to reach out and, and connect with them. I'd say try to connect from a human being level. Reach out to that person and get to know them, not from a work standpoint, but from a human being standpoint. Where did you grow up? You know, what was it? What was your favorite memory as, as a child? Why did you choose this career? Uh, what advice would you have for someone who's starting, starting off in the professional, on their professional journey? Some, some value-based questions, get to know them. Take initiative. The only thing that can happen is that if it, if it doesn't work, then there needs to be a larger organizational shift. You could be the one that originates that change by taking initiative and connecting as a human being be persistent and be courageous because it won't happen overnight. Hey, you be one of the challenges of uh, events like this is what's going to happen next. And that's when we all leave, we disperse. And the ideas and the encouragement that were here are no longer with us. What we want to offer all the participants is a way to reinforce and refresh our time here together today. And we can do that by making sure you can get weekly doses of inspiration uh, and thought evoking content through our blog and our podcast. And here's how you can do this. You can do this right now. Get your phone out and text REVIVE, R-E-V-I-V-E, to 33777. So get your phone out now. And for those of you in my generation, make believe the phone number is 33777. Then type in R-E-V-I-V, REVIVE. You'll be prompted to put your email in. You'll be a subscriber to our weekly podcasts and blog um, inspirational messages. So use that as a way to keep these ideas and fertilize your soil of transformation. The last thing we're going to say is this. There's a saying, knowledge is power. Yes, you probably heard that. And it's a lie. It's not true. It used to be true. There was a time where um, when a small group of people had the corner on information, that is powerful. But in today's world, who has access to information? Everybody. And when everyone has something, there's no more power. So knowledge is no longer power. Application is power. And that's important because what we talked about today, again, will change no thing. Nothing will change as a result of this lunch and learn. Things can change and will change when you take the information from this lunch and learn and this afternoon and tomorrow and, and, and next Monday, you make application. Transformation is about applying what you know. It's not about knowing more. So thanks for letting us hang out with you guys today. Let's get about our work. Rich, thank you so much. I have certainly taken many nuggets and gain several of those nuggets and I will use them. And I completely agree that you should always have some kind of motivational um, content coming through your email uh, to give you that boost of, you know, a reason uh, to remember why you are doing what you are doing um, and why it's motivating you. So if you sign up for the, the, Rich's emails and podcasts, I'm certain that you will get that motivation that you need uh, to just, you know, keep working at it and uh, chipping away uh, to you get where you want to get. So thank you so much, Rich, Sarah. This has been a very useful session and fulfilling. Um, if you would like to connect with Rich, uh, you may reach out to him by LinkedIn, and I will put that in the chat here shortly. And they also have their... Um, their information uh, or the um, information on um, Extraordinary Inc. Yeah. Hey, if we, if we didn't get to any comments, go to our website, reviveyourwork.com. Put your comment in there. We'll reply back to you specifically. That's reviveyourwork.com for your comments that we didn't get to today. Um, and if you have any questions for us, comments, concerns, you may reach out to us at the uh, Alumni Engagement Office at alumni at uncg.edu, uh, or you may also reach me on my LinkedIn page as well, UB Aranda Sandoval. Um, thank you so much for, again for being here with us. There is uh, another partnership that we will be having with uh, Healthy Relationships Institute Tuesday, February 16th. We will be looking at building healthier 
happier relationships, more details to come. So just mark your calendars, Tuesday, February 16th, it'll be one of our other Lunch and Learn sessions. Um, happy to have you guys here and welcome back. Yeah, thank you. Thank you, Rich. Bye, buenas tardes. Yes.